If you've got a Bible, why don't you open it to Ephesians and chapter 5, that passage uh, that, is, that we're going to be hearing read for us in a minute. But before we get there, I just want to summarize what we've done so far in the book of Ephesians. We've been working through it over the last few months, and uh, we need to understand what's happened in order for us to understand what Paul is going to say to us in our passage today. In the first part of Ephesians, we were told what God is busy doing in the world. Of course, God is controlling the orbits of the planets. He's running the nuclear reactors that we call stars so that we can have light and heat. But that's all easy stuff compared to what he's busy doing on the earth. Paul has told us that God is busy building an everlasting kingdom that will be under the command and control of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the tricky thing for God is that this kingdom is made up of people like you and I, people who aren't that keen to be under the command and control of anyone, let alone Jesus Christ. Easter reminds us of what we did to Jesus when God announced that Jesus was his choice of king. We very quickly arrested God's king and tortured him to death. So much for our, uh, our compliance to authority. We thought we'd got rid of the king, and so now we could rule ourselves as the human race. But actually, this was God's plan all along. It was through Jesus' death that God was going to be able to build his kingdom by forgiving our sins and adopting us into his family. Do you remember way back in chapter 1, verse 7? In Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. That means God can now take guilty people like us and make us righteous and include us in his glorious plan. Well, that's all the first half of the book of Ephesians. Now in the second half of his letter, Paul is going to tell us how all of that should affect our personal lives and our relationships. He summarizes everything he's going to say in the words in chapter 4, verse 1, live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Live a life worthy of the calling you've received. He's not saying, and we need to be very clear about this, he is not saying, live like this if you want to go to heaven. Rather, he's saying, if you've been saved by grace, if you have been redeemed and forgiven and adopted, all that stuff in chapters 1 through to 3, if you're part of God's kingdom, if you're going to heaven, then this is how you should live. You were not what you once were. You don't belong to the kingdom you once belonged to. You belong to a new kingdom, the kingdom of Christ. You don't serve the master you once served. Now you serve a new king. You are no longer darkness. Now you are light, he is going to say today. And so live a life worthy of the calling you've received. Well, let's listen to how someone who is light is supposed to live. Um, I'm going to ask our readers, Chris uh, and then Rob, I think, are going to bring us our reading for today. Thanks, Chris. The reading is from Ephesians chapter 5, verses 3 to 7. But among you, there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person is an idolater, has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. We continue with verses 8 to 14. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, and find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do 
with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible. And everything that is illuminated becomes a light. This is why it is said, wake up sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. This is Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 to 20. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, keep that passage open uh, where you can see it. We're going to be working our way through it, and there's quite a lot, as you heard, for us to cover. In all that we've just heard, Paul is simply saying to these Christians living in the city of Ephesus, remember who you are and be true to yourself. Be true to who you are. That's the message. It sounds easy enough in theory, but like I said, there's a problem. We don't like being told how to live. Even as Christians, we still want to rule ourselves. We like the idea that Jesus is our savior, that he loves me, that he died for my sins. But we don't like the idea that he's also the Lord. I don't want him interfering, let alone ruling, my life. That means when we hear passage, passages like this, we get resentful. Who does God think he is telling me how to live my life? Why is God always trying to spoil everyone's fun? Why can't we just be happy and enjoy ourselves? And we blame the church too. The church needs to catch a wake up. Things have changed and the church hasn't kept up. Well, is that what God is doing by giving us a passage like this? Is he trying to make us unhappy? No, of course not. Jesus said that he came so that we could have life and have it to the full. These instructions are not there to make our lives a misery. They're there so that we can enjoy life to the full. They're a bit like the warning signs on St. Helia Beach. We heard about the explosion on Jersey Island uh, in, in St. Helia. During my sabbatical a few years ago, I went to work at a church on that island, on Jersey Island. Just off the coast of St. Helia uh, is a 16th century castle called Elizabeth Castle. It's a delightful 20-minute walk out to the castle, and you can spend a whole morning uh, exploring those ancient ruins and uh, looking in the rock pools that are surrounding that little castle. However, as many unfortunate visitors to the castle have found out over the centuries, a visit to the castle can quickly turn deadly because Jersey has the third highest tidal variation in the world. It, that means that the sea rises up to 12 meters at high tide. That's 40 foot, a 40 foot variation in the tide. And it comes in incredibly quickly. One minute you're looking for treasure on the dry seabed around the castle. And the next thing, the Atlantic Ocean is pouring in, covering everything. Now, fortunately for people like me, there were plenty of warning signs on the beach. There's even a siren that goes off to tell you to get moving because this tide is coming in. That's a bit like the warnings we read about in our passage today. They're not there to spoil your fun and ruin your life. They're there to warn you of danger so that you can enjoy yourself safely and live life to the full. And yet, if we read these instructions the wrong way, we start thinking, oh, this is so old-fashioned. The Bible is so out of touch, so unrealistic. I'll decide what I'm going to do. I don't need the church controlling 
how I live. But just imagine if you had that attitude to the warning signs on Centelia Beach. Imagine if you had that attitude to the warning signs that the army puts up around minefields. When that high tide warning siren goes off, are you really going to say, stop trying to spoil my fun? Stop trying to control me. No one's going to tell me what to do. I'll decide how long I stay out here. Well, good luck with that. No, the sensible thing to do is to run. God gives us warnings for our own good to enable us to save us, to save us from disaster so that we can enjoy ourselves safely. I know I'm repeating myself. Let's try and remember that, though, as we unpack this passage. The passage breaks neatly into three sections. And the first thing that God is saying to us in the passages have nothing to do with the deeds of darkness. Verse three, among you, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity. The Greek word for sexual immorality is porneia. Porneia. It's the word we get pornography from. But porneia is much wider than pornography. It covers all sexual activity outside of a marriage between a man and a woman. Any sexual activity outside of a marriage between a man and a woman is, in the Bible's word, porneia. Now, God is often accused of being homophobic, but he's not, as we see here. God's not homophobic. He's pornophobic. God hates any form of sexual immorality, and it doesn't matter whether that immorality is heterosexual or homosexual. And did you notice Paul adds the word impurity or any kind of impurity, says Paul, it includes inappropriate sexual comments and sexual thoughts as well. Now, I know how that sound, sounds, and we immediately think, how repressive, you know, how harsh, how narrow. Is that really what God expects? Why is God so anti-sex? Well, actually, it's because God is so pro-sex that God reserves sex for marriage. Sex is God's idea. It's a precious gift. It's a gift. For marriage. It's like God's wedding present to a couple who get married. We think this sounds ridiculous because our society has cheapened and perverted sex so badly. We shouldn't read this and say, how unreasonable is God? We should read this and say, how twisted has our world become? How have we got this so wrong? Paul gives us the reason we must guard against porneia. He says, verse 3, because porneia, sexual immorality and impurity, are improper for God's holy people. You see, sexual immorality and impurity is what defines the life of someone who doesn't know Christ. They are not the marks of a child of God. Paul says, not even a hint. In other words, don't see how close you can get to the edge. Don't see how much you can get away with. Don't try and excuse it. Don't try and justify it. Not even a hint, says Paul. In Timothy, Paul says that men are to treat women that they're not married to the way men treat their own sisters. And I take it the opposite. The reverse is true as well. Treat people of the opposite sex that you're not married to like your sibling and you've got the right idea. You're on the right track. I don't know if you can see this picture from where you are. It's a picture of cesium uh, in a test tube in a laboratory. Cesium is a beautiful rare metal that glitters and shines like gold. A few years ago, there was a break-in at a hospital in the United Kingdom, and the thieves stole a small amount of refined cesium that was being used to treat cancer. Well, within three days, all four robbers were dead, and 100,000 people in that area had to be treated for radiation poisoning from a tiny amount of cesium. You don't even want a hint of cesium anywhere near you when it comes to sexual activity outside of marriage, Paul says, not even a hint. Not because it'll send you to hell, but rather because you are going to heaven. 
You're a child of the king. So be true to the king and be true to yourself. This will affect what apps I have on my phone. This will affect the people I follow on Instagram, the programs I watch on Netflix. This will affect the links that I click on in my browser. And then to sexual immorality and impurity, Paul adds greed. Bit of a surprise. I wouldn't have put those in the same stable. What's greed got to do with sexual immorality? Well, actually, quite a lot. Greed and covetousness are behind sexual immorality. It's the desire to have more of someone else's body than is yours to have. But Paul widens it to all greed. Did you notice that? In other words, all insatiable desires for things that God hasn't given you. Our culture tells us that we should have more, more sexual experience, more money, more power, more control, get as much as you can while you can, is the message of our world. And when you think about it, at the heart of greed is the desire to be God. It's the desire to be able to take whatever you want, whenever you want it. You'll remember that last week, we saw that Paul is writing against a backdrop of rank cultural and religious paganism in the city of Ephesus, where even temple prostitution was not just tolerated, but encouraged. It was the norm. It was completely acceptable. Paul says, yes, you were once immersed in that culture. You were once part of the Ephesian culture, but now you are in Christ. You're now part of the kingdom of God. You need to leave Ephesian culture and ethics behind and take on the culture and ethics of Christ's kingdom. But it's not just how you act. It's also how you speak, says Paul, verse 4. Nor should there be any obscenity, foolish talk or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. Paul is talking about a dirty mind expressing itself in vulgar conversation. You might remember when Donald Trump was running for president, his comments that he had uttered about women came out for all the world to hear. Uh, and people excused those comments. Do you remember the excuse? Ah, it's just locker room banter was the excuse. It's locker room talk. Well, friends, locker room banter or not, Paul says there is no place for that sort of speech. It is out of place, says Paul, out of place. And not even in the locker room is that okay. It is entirely inappropriate for the Christian. Christian men are to stand up for women who could be their mothers or their sisters or their daughters. And so we are to reflect the culture and the norms and the standards of Jesus's kingdom in what we do with our bodies, in our ambitions, and in the way we speak. And in the place, says Paul, of vulgar speech, there should be, well, thanksgiving, he says, thanksgiving. And when you think about it, being immoral, being greedy, being vulgar in how you speak are all signs of unthankfulness, of not being grateful for what God has given you or not given you, as the case may be. God is generous. God is good. God knows what is good for you. He gives when actually he has the right to take. And so our speech should always be marked with thankfulness. But why is Paul making such a fuss about all of this? If sex is between consenting adults, isn't that all that matters? Aren't there more serious things for Paul to worry about? But no, actually they aren't. Verse 5, for of this you can be sure, says Paul. No immoral, impure or greedy person, such a person as an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. If this is who you are, if this is how you live, if this is your habit, you are not to assume that you are part of God's kingdom. Yes, God's kingdom is for sinners, that is true, but it's for forgiven sinners, sinners who have repented, sinners like these Ephesian sinners, who came out of their culture to join the kingdom of God. God's kingdom is for sinners who are seeking to live with Jesus Christ as their God and their king. And Paul says, don't let anyone tell you anything different. 
Don't let anyone tell you that this doesn't matter. Verse 6, let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. God's wrath, God's wrath is God's considered, settled, just, deserved hostility against people. It's very, very serious. It's more dangerous than cesium. Getting what you deserve in hell or getting what you don't deserve in heaven, those are very big deals. There is nothing more serious, actually, to worry about. You can laugh it off as God, you can laugh off God's warnings as ridiculous religious extremism, if you like, but you really don't want to get this wrong. Hell is a place of awful regret. Don't live to regret ignoring the warning signs that God has planted for us here in the book of Ephesians. No, he is not putting up a warning sign to try and ruin your life. The signs are there so that you don't ruin your life. So Paul says, verse 7, God's wrath is coming on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. Don't play with fire. Be careful not to become an accomplice with those who do ignore God. It will end badly. Unforgiven sin results in something worse than death. You won't just be swept away by the incoming Atlantic Ocean. You'll be swept away by a wave of judgment that you have brought on yourself. Well, Paul has given us all the negative reasons to take God seriously, but there's a positive reason too. He says, have nothing to do with the deeds of darkness because you are light in the Lord. Verse 8, for you, were, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Paul often speaks like this. You were dead in your transgressions and sins, but now you have been made alive in Christ. You were far off from God, but now you have been brought near through the blood of Christ. You were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Light and darkness are powerful metaphors for good and evil. In one of Jesus' most famous sayings, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not live in darkness, but will have the light of life. So a Christian is someone who has been brought from darkness into the kingdom of light. But if you're a Christian, you haven't just been brought into the light. Paul says, you are light. Jesus said exactly the same thing to his disciples. Do you remember? You are salt. You are light. Paul doesn't just say you were in the dark. He says you were dark. You were darkness, says Paul. That's scary. Before you became a Christian, darkness was your identity. But God in his grace and mercy has made us light. Verse 8, live as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Goodness and righteousness and truth. The fruit of being light. Imagine being part of a family that is marked by goodness and righteousness and truth. Imagine being part of a community that is marked by goodness and righteousness and truth. Isn't that what we're actually all looking for? By contrast, the darkness has no fruit. Did you notice that in verse 11? Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. You see, light always shows up what's hiding in the darkness and what is done in secret. If you drop a spoon behind the stove and you've got to retrieve it, what do you do? You get your torch out and a long stick because you don't want to put your hand under there. You shine your light under that stove and you see six months worth of food scraps and nasty, creepy, crawly things. The rest of the kitchen might be spick and span, but hiding in the dark, well, who knows what's under there. But shining a light in there exposes what's really hiding in the dark. And so light exposes, and then it transforms, doesn't it? Because then you move the stove out the way, you get the mop, or rather you get your husband to get the mop, and he must clean. Make that clean. Make all that stuff go away. Light exposes, 
and then light transforms, says Paul. He says, everything exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. So be true to yourself, says Paul. If you're a Christian, then you have been made a light. So shine, produce a harvest of fruit, goodness and righteousness and truth. But Paul knows that not everyone who is reading this letter is already a Christian. And so he issues an invitation in verse 14. Wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. You see, God's offer of salvation is for everyone, for anyone. Christ is happy to shine his light on anyone who will wake up and come to him for forgiveness. This little excerpt is probably part of an ancient Christian Easter hymn that was sung in the early church. God is inviting people who are still in the dark, as it were, to come to him so they can be made alive and made light. So have nothing to do with the deeds of darkness because you are light in the Lord. So, as he finishes off, be very careful of how you walk. The Christian life is to be a careful walk. And Paul outlines two aspects of walking carefully. He says, verse 15, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. In other words, don't waste your life. Verse 16, make the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. The days are evil. Life is full of danger. It's easy to get shipwrecked. Don't take your bearings from society or from your culture or even from your friends. God has given us the Bible, his word. So you have a compass that shows true north all the time. Take your bearings from the Bible and follow the course that God has given you. We're not all on the same course. We don't all have the same course. God is leading us in every different direction through life. But whatever your course is, God's word is your navigator, your Google Maps. He has told us the routes to avoid. He has warned us of the hazards along the way. So follow his lead and you won't waste time going off course, getting lost and hurting yourself and your family. And make the most of the opportunities he gives you to live as light and to tell other people about the light. Verse 17, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Now, what Paul says here is actually very important in our day and age. Paul doesn't say that we have to discover what God's will is for our lives. Did you notice that? Rather, Paul says you need to understand what God's will is for your life. God's will for your life is what Paul has been telling you throughout the whole of chapter 5. Not a hint of sexual immorality. That's God's will. No impurity, no greed, rather thanksgiving. That's God's will for your life. Not being partners any longer with those who have chosen to be darkness. Rather living as light and goodness, righteousness and truth. There's God's will for your life. Exposing the deeds of darkness, especially in your own life. And being wise and making the most of every opportunity God gives you to share Christ with those around you. That's God's will for your life. Get on and do it, is what Paul is saying. Contrary to what a lot of churches teach, God does not promise to reveal a specific will for you and your life. You are not Abraham. You are not Moses. You are not King David. And you most certainly are not an apostle. It's only people like that who receive specific instructions about their lives from God. We are the equivalent of the Israelites who followed Moses. He was their guide. He was the one given specific instructions. They just had to follow. God gives us the will for our lives in general terms, not in specifics. That's why Paul says we are to understand God's will, not discover God's will. Well, Paul has one last instruction before he's done. He says, verse 18, be filled with the Spirit. Again, Paul uses contrast to make his point. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery, he says. Instead, be 
filled with the Spirit. Do you see the, the contrast? Remember we said last week that the worship services down at Diana's temple in Ephesus were characterized by all sorts of sexual immorality and debauchery fueled by alcohol. And that behavior, behavior flowed over into the social life of the city where excess was the norm. I mean, let's not put words in God's mouth here. He's not forbidding the drinking of alcohol. God just says, don't get drunk. That's no longer who you are. Instead of coming under the influence of alcohol, rather live under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Be filled with him, says Paul. Instead of losing your sense of reason and your inhibitions and your conscience, instead of losing control, we are to be filled with the Spirit and take control. Allow Christ to dwell in your hearts and minds, he said earlier in the book. And Paul ends off showing us what a Spirit-filled life looks like. You want to know evidence for the Holy Spirit in someone's life? Here it is, verse 19. Speak to one another in psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Filled with the Spirit, we are to joyfully remind each other of the gospel. Rather than being greedy and ungrateful and immoral, our lives are to be marked with thanksgiving, says Paul. We've all come through a really tough two or three years, haven't we? I wonder if we can still find things to be thankful for. There's plenty. There is always plenty to be thankful for. And notice that when Paul talks about being filled with the Spirit, there is no mention of the gifts of the Spirit. Isn't that strange? There's no tongues. There's no laughing in the Spirit. There's no prophecy. There's no words from the Lord. Just, says Paul, inward joy and thanksgiving, and outward speech that encourages and, and comforts and builds others up. Those, then, are the true marks of being filled with the Spirit. And actually, he says exactly the same thing in the book of Galatians. The presence of the Holy Spirit will be evidence, says Paul, in love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, bringing yourself under control and under the control of the Spirit. That's exactly what Paul is saying here. And you do meet people like that, don't you? People who ooze uh, evidence for the Holy Spirit, never complaining, never grumbling, always grateful for everything, no matter how bad things get, always singing God's praises, always reminding others of how kind God is. It's so encouraging to spend time with people like that, people who are spirit-filled people. Well, let me wrap up. This then is a picture of what it means to be true to yourself if you're a Christian. Being filled with the Spirit, singing about God, singing to God, being thankful, grateful, joyful, walking as lights, turning our backs on the deeds of darkness, living lives that are marked by goodness and righteousness and truth. So let's embrace the warning God has lovingly given us this morning. Don't get resentful and grumpy and accuse God of trying to spoil your fun and ruin your life. Instead, listen to your loving Heavenly Father. Have nothing to do with the deeds of darkness because you are now light in the Lord. And think very carefully how you walk. Let's pray together. Well, Father, we thank you for speaking so clearly to us today. Thank you for warning us of the pitfalls of blindly following things that seem attractive and appealing and yet are actually Trojan horses. We confess that we haven't lived the way you have said we should live. We have heard that we are light in the Lord, so help us, we pray, to live as light. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.